Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the Roaring Twenties with Rachel Mouchoir, VP of Sales at Intel. Rachel, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much, Darren. I am honored and humbled to be here. Oh, we're, we're so happy that you're on the show. You, you, you actually love the show. You said, hey, this is great stuff, Darren. Um, and thank you for supporting it and, and welcome. Um, today, I, I want to get your insight on, hey, what's going to happen this year? I mean, COVID threw us through a major, major um, paradigm shift, whatever you want to call it, disruption inflection point. I've heard them all. What's going to, what do we see for 2021? Get out your crystal ball. Let us hear. Right. So, you know, there are so many emotions that people think about when they think about just the past 12 months. And clearly 2020 was marked with unmistakable change and uncertainty for all of us professionally and personally. You know, there were 47% of adults in their 40s and 50s had a parent 65 or older and were also trying to homeschool their children in 2020. We were all physically isolated and seeming stasis within our homes. But a remarkable thing happened. That remarkable thing is during this stretch of physical isolation, connectivity grew. The pace of change from a technology perspective accelerated. We've seen more technology happen in the last 12 months, Darren, than we had in the last three years. In fact, it has been COVID that has been the spur for most technology changes. And frankly, everyone's sense of possibility has been rejuvenated. And even though we've all been quarantined, we've also been unlocked and freed for the future and freed for bringing in the Roaring Twenties. And the great thing about the Roaring Twenties, before we get into some of the key trends, Darren, is every single one of us had to pause. All of us had to figure out what was important to us and what we were going to carry forward into the roaring 20s. Nothing is going to be as it was. And now all of us hold our teams, our friends, our families, and the relationships that we've developed way closer than we ever have. In fact, 2020 was filled with so many black swan moments that we all had the opportunity to learn from and not be paralyzed by. And as we think about the roaring 20s, not every year will be 2020, but the lessons of 2020 will make us better every year going forward. Here's to the roaring 20s. No, I, I hear you. I totally agree. My, my wife and I were actually talking about this the other day. What, what changed for us? Our, we're doing our kids' uh, business every day. Where before, oh, they just go off to school and maybe they have homework. And I also noticed my relationships uh, with some of my customers are actually deeper now than they were before because I'm not spending time on an airplane. I'm not, you know, traveling somewhere or it's, it's much more, um, I hate to use the word intimate, but in some, re in some respects it is. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a very fundamental shift in the way that we think about things. Totally it agree. It really has, but I'll tell you, the other thing is the pandemic has created more responsibilities than ever before. And I think about, uh, I think about you and I, Darren, we're, we're kind of the sandwich generation, right? Yeah, Xers, yep. 
Yeah, we're, we're juggling both the needs of children at home. And in my case, four young children homeschooling while still trying to run a billion dollar business and caring for elderly parents. Um, and then it, it just like this, it becomes a, almost a cacophony that you've got to navigate through. And whether your kids are in college or, you know, they're a three-year-old at home, you still, you've got to figure out how to juggle all of those things. And I believe, um, you know, one of the key things in 21 is going to be how we continue to leverage um, technology to keep us connected. No, I, I totally agree. In fact, I just interviewed a company um, and they'll be on the podcast in a couple of weeks that took Zoom on steroids and made it a social thing. And they've been doing this for like three years where they drop into people's cubes, even though people don't have cubes in their company, mm. just like you would do in the office or there's water cooler. Hey, let's go meet at the water, water cooler and chat. They've, right. they've, they've extended the social things that we normally do at work into this virtual space, which is, is pretty clever. So I think we're gonna see more and more ideas like that. Well, and here's an interesting stat for you. 32% of US adults have had a virtual party or social <laughs> gathering online with friends and family. And I'm not just talking about, you know, like this communication that we're having, but you think about some of the things that we've done um, at Intel over the last year. We visited a virtual goat farm. Um, we've had yoga instructors come in and we've leveraged technology to really fight that isolation. And as we go into you know, the rest of the 20s, um, technology is going to become a cornerstone for every major transformation that's going to happen regardless if it is the private sector or the public sector. No, I agree. So what, what do you see? I mean, we, we know the change, the nomadic, I've got a, a nephew, great example. Um, he was living in the Bay Area, San Francisco, paying $5,000 a month for his uh, little apartment. He and his pal said, we, we can't go in the office. They've been living all over the world, working. <laughs> Costa Rica, they're in Park City now. I'm like, so we're seeing this nomadic workforce as well that, you know, he has no kids, no family, nothing. So he's doing that. This remote work concept, I think is here to stay. What do you think as a CIO coming in this year, what do I need to focus on this year? What, what do you think is going to be key to, to getting out of this next year in a better position than at the beginning of the year? So I think the, the most important part there, Darren, is, you know, you talked about the nomadic lifestyle. Uh, geez, I can't even imagine how awesome it would be to not work in my home office every single day and actually be able to work from Costa Rica. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, sandwich generation, young kids, elderly. We, we have responsibilities. <laughs> yeah, we have different responsibilities. Yeah. But what you're talking about right now is really emblematic of the future of work. And we are living the future of work, right? It's not just the U.S. that is a work from home economy. It is a global phenomena, right? Almost... 85 or higher percent of organizations have expanded or implemented, you know, a variety of work from home policies that are going to extend past COVID-19. Why do you think that is? I mean, I've heard that before, but why do you think that is the case? So I think the, you know, the old adage of, um, geez, you've got to be in the office in order to be effective. And a lot of those old idealisms that, frankly, many of us grew up with have absolutely been shattered in 2020. As companies had to immediately pivot to work from home, many of the 
uh, companies quickly realized that, uh, geez, our real estate costs potentially could be reduced as we move forward because we're just as productive at home as we are in the office. In fact, the average workday at home has lengthened. So just think about your workday, right? For me, I get up in the morning, I get my four kids ready for school. Um, uh, they sit down and they do their homeschool. I start working. Um, I don't have my commute anymore. As you said, I'm not on an airplane. I don't shut my PC down until well after dinner. Um, I'm leveraging technology to connect in a different way. Now, I'm not saying that a longer workday is a good thing. I'm just saying it has been the result of people working from home. No, I, I, I agree with you there. Um, because, hey, I can get to that thing I need to work on after dinner or after the kids are in bed, mm -hmm. or I can do it tomorrow morning before anyone wakes up. That's my most productive time is 5 a.m. until the, the rest of the family starts waking up. So I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's, and that's a downside as well. We, we don't shut down. That's right. right? Because yeah. uh, literally in my house, uh, my office was taken over by my kids doing homeschool, mm -hmm. right? online school. So I'm in the bedroom. I, my commute is the shortest it's ever been. Roll out of bed, and there's my desk, right? Right. Right. So I, I totally understand that. So you know the other thing that's interesting as you're talking about roll, roll out of bed and there's my office. I've talked to a number of executive women who have um, come to the realization that, you know, they spend a minimum of 20 minutes a day, just getting ready to go to work, whether that's hair, that's clothes, that's makeup. And one of the things that COVID has, um, has taught many of these women is you can save that 20 minutes and use that 20 minutes to listen to an innovative podcast, to get caught up on email. And, um, you know, I know this isn't a technology thing, but I'd be surprised that as we go into 21, if you start seeing more natural um, <laughs> options at work, certainly for me, I'm not going to do it anymore. I've yeah. threatened to go up to the office in yoga pants. <laughs> well, in fact, in, in my podcast where I talk about 2020 in review, it's the business casual uh, mullet, yeah. right? I, you know, I don't know the last time I put on um, pants. I wear shorts all the time, sure. right? <laughs> yeah, so that reminds me of a funny story this morning as I rolled out of bed to my virtual office. Um, my kids are like, geez, mom, it's nice that you actually are in a different outfit than you've been wearing for the last four days. <laughs> yeah, I've been there myself. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit, though, um, more about some of the, you know, and I know you have a podcast coming up around what 2020 looks like. Uh, and we're certainly, you know, I've just spent the last little bit talking about some of the advantages that technology has um, brought to companies. But I also think that it is extremely important for us to realize how fortunate we are to be able to homeschool our kids. And when that decision was made, my guess is many of, um, many of the listeners either had laptops for their children or they were able to go out and get one. Um, in fact, did you know that one in four American households have at least one child age kid, 14 years or younger at home? One in wow. four. Wow, that's a lot. Which is a lot. But then you add that into the digital divide and what that means as we move forward into the roaring 20s, right? You think about all of the students that have come from disadvantaged backgrounds who probably haven't had a computer to work on. 
In fact, a World Economic Forum study just said that 25% of US students from a disadvantaged background have not had a computer during the last year. That's, yeah, that's not how it should be. That's awful. That's not how it should be. And if they haven't had a computer, they also haven't had access to the internet. So as we move into the roaring 20s, we've got a whole set or a whole generation of children that have just spent the last 12 months homeschooling, potentially without a computer, without access to the internet. And I- It's I, increasing that digital divide. It is. Um, and and I, I was worried about that when this first happened as well. I said, uh, I, I even told my wife, whoever gets online first has an advantage. Um, uh, and, the, and the kids that don't get online are going to be disadvantaged uh, for sure. Well, um, and here's something else interesting that I just learned. Um, in December, all of the job losses in the U.S., all of them were women. Wow. All of them were women in December. Did they say why? They think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, again, I talked about the pandemic creating a bunch more responsibilities. And when you've got young kids at home that are trying to homeschool and you're an hourly worker, how do you do it? You don't. Yeah. You don't. So I think as we go into the 20s, while there's a ton of opportunity, um, I still believe that we have got such a long ways to go in the 20s around gender equality. And certainly, you know, during lockdown, fathers have nearly doubled the time that they've spent on childcare. But when you've got all of the job losses in December belonging to women, and of that, even a higher percentage of URMs, we've got to go figure that out in the 20s. And it can't just be about technology. No, I, I agree with you there. But hopefully technology can help. I, yes. Right? Um, and and I, I think that can be the case. So as a CIO, let's get back to the, the CIOs out there. What do I do? What do I put in my, in my roadmap for this year to overcome uh, these problems that I'm potentially seeing here. Losing some of my workforce because they've got other responsibilities at home. Um, dealing with people working from home. Um, how, how does this all boil down? So I think there's a, a handful of things that become uh, almost strategic imperatives for IT. And I think one of those strategic imperatives really has to do with then we're, I'm going to break this down into, you know, traditional IT applications, network, and data center. So let's start with applications first. So from an application perspective, I think CIOs have really got to figure out how do they enable contactless, meaning how do you drive everything as a service? And this isn't just for retailers. This is for healthcare companies. This is for um, the government. This is for manufacturing and automating warehouses. What do you need to do to permanently boost your productivity by driving more contactless? What, what is your roadmap for everything as a service over the next 12 months? Okay. Point one. Got it. Um, I think the second thing is uh, around <clears throat> applications is who are your consumers? Who are your customers? Whether your customer is, you know, mission centric, like it is in the public sector or in the private sector, it's the average um, person at home really figuring out who is your consumer, and how do they digest content? 
right? If you think about how you and I grew up, Darren, um, we grew up on Saturday mornings being the only day that there were cartoons on. Absolutely. The only day. That was the and best then, day of the week. Right. <laughs> then, and you didn't want to, you didn't want to leave that TV because you might miss Scooby-Doo. That's right. Yep. But then as we started to grow up, then there would be cartoons occasionally after school, like DuckTales. I'm dating myself. Um, and that's how they reached, you know, that's how big companies reached their audience was through that medium. Yep. But that's, that's not changed. the medium that people use anymore. So you think about Netflix plus Disney plus, um, all the online video games, you know, most people aren't going to go back to a movie theater. So if you are thinking about your customer first, how are you accessing them? All right, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, applications, and I just gave you a couple examples. You know, when we talked about everything as a surface, that could be uh, face recognition, that can be, you know, uh, robots, that can be, you know, any number of, of things from an application perspective. The next really comes down to the network. Um, and how important your network is and that your network really becomes the turbo boost to all things digital. Now, obviously to the CIOs that are out there, um, I'm assuming that there is an inherent level of security in all of these because security has got to be top of mind for it, it's, it's just embedded in these, but when it comes to the network, really thinking about, hey, if I'm going to automate my factories or if I'm gonna automate healthcare or I'm gonna provide telehealth or I'm gonna do something with the US Navy, do you have the network to enable that? And do you have the network to enable that in the next five years as 5G becomes more of a reality? Or are you still investing in yesterday's technology when it comes to the network? Well, and I'm glad you brought this up because the network is no longer just in your data center. That's right. Right. I mean, uh, we, we saw a huge shift this last year with um, software as a service. And all of a sudden, and even in Intel, we accelerated the rollout of um, Office 365, Microsoft 365. Mm -hmm. I no longer get on the VPN at work anymore. Right. Right. Where before I was completely tied to it. Now I'm not. So now my network is extended beyond my traditional data center. So it, it's, it's a key aspect that uh, we need to pay attention to. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, gone are the days. And again, I grew up in the IT world where, <clears throat> um, you know, we went from dial up to, WANs and LANs to what you just talked about of eliminating VPN. But I think too often, you know, when people talk about, you know, the trends of what's next, they don't talk about the importance of the network because it's not sexy. No, it's, it's supposed to just be there and work, right? Just like security. Nobody really wants to talk about security as a trend because it's not sexy and it's scary. But you start to think about all of the endpoints that are now becoming That's crazy. pervasive into our everyday life, right? I talked about everything as a service. So as you start to provide more kiosks or as you start to provide, you know, different ways to uh, get to your customers or different ways for your employees to access you, you have just increased the threat surface exponentially. And the CISOs out there, their minds are exploding, thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how am I going to manage all of those attack service, those attack surfaces? Then you add on the network, then you think about, you know, the fact that everybody's got more and more devices, and as cities become smarter, and as there's more autonomous driving, 
then you've got all these different communication points and you've got to figure that out as part of your security roadmap, right? It's not just about, um, you know, securing data at rest and data in motion anymore. It's everything in between. And that's got to be a key aspect of any CIO's roadmap as we move into the 20s. Totally agree. Totally agree. Not sexy, but important. Yep. In fact, critical. Yeah, and I've seen too many companies ignore it. Mm-hmm. And, and then they get in over, over the top of their skis and, and uh, they're in five feet of powder and they don't know what to do. Oh, so. Yeah, for sure. Okay, third point. Um, so let's talk about uh, data centers. Yeah, I don't know. Should we invest in data centers anymore? Everything's going to the cloud. You know, um, that's actually a, a funny statement. The reason I think it's funny is um, it's not, I think everyone is so wrapped up in data centers, cloud, and really where I'm headed, Darren, um, even as I start to make my next career move, is it's not about data centers. It's about centers of data. Yep. And where is that center of data going to be? And where will it best be served? Is it best served in an on-prem data center with certain workloads? Perhaps. Um, you talked about Office 365. Where is that best served? Well, everybody in the IT world knows, right? That's a great workload to be in the cloud. But when you start to think about some super top secret things that are the DNA of your companies or the DNA of this country, some of those things may never move to the cloud. So for a CIO, it's super important to understand what are my centers of data and how are those centers of data providing service to my employees and to my customers. And when you start to think about it in that way, it starts to help you answer questions like, hey, um, if this is way out at the edge, how long does it take for something that's sitting at the edge to do the whole traverse of the network back to the data center, wherever the data center is? Um, What does that look like? How do I start to think about uh, using my network to, you know, provide centers of data in ways that are closer to my employees or closer to my customers. So is the cloud growing? Absolutely. 30, 40% per year. Huge, huge cloud growth. And it's going to continue to grow. But the important part there for CIOs is to really figure out What makes the most sense as I'm starting to lay out my um, five-year roadmap? What do I need to do with machine learning? What do I need to do with high-performance compute? What do I do with voice assistance? Oh, and did I mention the network and security? Um, When you start to think about them in those ways, it starts to really help you build out What is the right strategy for my centers of data in terms of recovery, in terms of storage, in terms of uh, performance? All of those pieces become critically important because there's only so much money that CIOs have today. And how do you use that money in a way that optimizes your customers, optimizes your employees? And for those public companies, makes Wall Street happy. Yeah, you is- know, it's, it's interesting because what you're talking about is the shift I've been preaching for the last five years or so. CIOs need to get out of managing infrastructure and managing data and mm-hmm. information. They're not chief infrastructure officers. They're chief information officers. So maybe, maybe the pandemic has forced the hand of, of many because their main concern should be the information, not the infrastructure. And I like how you called it a, a center of data. I, I love that. Um, 
Well, you can coin it, Darren, and I will continue to follow yeah. you on your podcast. And <laughs> there's data. Every single time I'm going to collect a... There, uh, there you go. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, at least a half a percent of what I make with the podcast. How's that sound? That's, that's awesome, especially since your podcast is making zero dollars. That is exactly right. <laughs> but hey, if we can, you know, all kidding aside, if we can start to share some of these concepts with your followership and they're able to make strategic changes both in their hiring practices and in how they service their customers that's a good enough royalty for me thanks for listening to embracing digital transformation today if you liked our episode go ahead and give us five stars on your favorite podcast or video streaming site you can also find out more on embracingdigital.com. Until next time, keep moving forward and do something wonderful.